Hi everyone, my name is Alex Dorr and I'm the owner and founder of Mushroom Revival. We are a functional mushroom company and we love cordyceps. This is our bread and butter and at the time of recording, we are currently the largest grower of cordyceps militaris mushrooms in the United States and the only certified organic farm. Now we made this video because one, we love cordyceps and two, we want to share with the world how we grow Corsair's Militaris at a farm on a commercial and certified organic scale. Now, this, is, this video is for growers who want to grow their own, but it's also for the people who just want to sneak peek in our operation. Now, we want to create more jobs, more farmers, and more access to functional mushrooms, and more people raving about how amazing mushrooms are. So, the rest of this video will be led by my partner, Lyra Nimakel, and we're just going to show you some tips and tricks, some formulas that we've developed, some techniques that we've developed, and a lot of our trial and error that we've developed over the, the last couple years. So hopefully you can learn from our mistakes, we can push the industry forward, and keep raving about mushrooms and growing Cordyceps Militaris. So thank you for tuning in, hope you like it. Much love. In this video, we are going to go over a method of Cordyceps Militaris cultivation that we call the doubling method. It was inspired by the rice cooker tech introduced to us by Ryan Paul Gates and has been through many transformations from there to get to where it is now. If you're wondering why we call it the doubling method, this is why. We cook and inoculate in these silicone bags and its fleshy translucence arguably resembles a dumpling. Once upon a time, Mushroom Revival used to cultivate in these 16 ounce pint jars, which was beautiful and foolproof, but extremely tedious for our scale. So we were very adamant about getting a bin method into our systems. So the dumpling method allows you to do a little bit more per day. Some key differences between the rice cooker tech and our dumpling method is that number one, we don't use a rice cooker, but a pressure steam sterilizer. And we load up as many of these bags as we can into one sterilizer and go from there. We then will unload these in front of the flow hood and the bag allows you to introduce your inoculation and evenly mix up everything in the bag. You'll probably find, if you try this method, that the grains on the bottom will be mushy and the grains on the top of the bag will be a little dry. Um, we've tried everything we can to mitigate this and have gotten as close as we reasonably can, at least with the pressure steam sterilizer. And what's really helping is the fact that you can manipulate these bags without touching them. So this was a really big help as far as sterility. You open it up, put in your liquid culture and you close it. So it is only exposed to the outside air for seconds. And that will allow you to mix the substrate and become more uniform. Uh, so that, that's the main difference between the two. The second is that we do a different method of sterilization. We do wipe down our bins with a cleaner um, and that will all go into the next video but we use dry sterilization as well um, with ultraviolet light and this allows us to have more bins readily sterilized all at once. So ultimately this method is just extremely efficient and can allow us to get 15 times more done in one morning than we were doing in almost in a week. This method was developed not only for large-scale cultivation but also to comply with USDA organic farming standards as well as a, an aim to have zero waste. Another challenge worth mentioning, and this goes for any cordyceps cultivator, is the strain or the genetics. So if you're doing your own ascospore work, then you're probably more advanced and you know what to look for with these things. Um, but if you're even doing your own spore work, you can't guarantee that you will get consistent or promising yields. So just make sure that you take your time before you bring any genetics into bulk cultivation or before you decide to just work with one set of genetics. It is often smart to not put all of your eggs in one basket and be working with multiple different strains in case one of them senenses or who knows what. If you are sourcing your genetics from another 
source. Um, just make sure that you're buying them from someone who knows what they're doing and from a source that's tried and true. Um, we've done stuff from Wildcrafts and had a lot of success with it, but we choose to purchase our strains from Terrestrial Fungi because Ryan from Gates is a genius and has done all of the really tough science behind getting um, a promising strain. So that's what we do here at Mushroom Revival. There are definitely other great sources of Rhizops Militaris, but that is the one that we like to go with. In this section, we will cover how we prepare our substrate. This is the result of several months of experimentation, observation, and data collection. We hope this information will serve as a jumping off point for further exploration. This recipe falls under guidelines we must adhere to to be certified organic. Some ingredients, such as peptones, have been shown to greatly benefit cordyceps growth, but are off limits to us. The most common grain choices for cordyceps are white or brown rice, wheat, barley, or a combination. For simplicity's sake, we will be using only brown rice in this video. Different grains have different nutritional content and absorb varying amount of liquid when cooking. We have mainly experimented with rice and wheat and have found three parts brown rice and one part white wheat to be an ideal ratio. If we were using this combination today, we would add slightly more liquid to our broth recipe to account for the extra moisture the wheat would absorb. Others have experimented with a wide variety of substrate and additives including wild rice, millet, legumes, insects, vegetables, oatmeal, and even eggs. Another factor we think worthy of exploration is soaking the grains prior to cooking. Grain soaking for 6 to 12 hours will undergo an enzymatic fermentation process that frees up more nutrients. This is done for koji and other edible molds grown on grain, so it may well benefit cordyceps. However, this would affect the amount of broth needed and the time required to cook which we have not fully explored. As nutritious as whole grains are, cordyceps appreciate a little more to feed on. Creating a broth to cook your grains in provides additional nutrients the grains alone won't provide. We use dry malt extract to provide sugars, mostly maltose, gypsum for calcium and sulfur, nutritional yeast for nitrogen and B vitamins, and some potato starch for an easy access food to jumpstart the fungus. We use one liter of broth for every 1.6 kilograms of brown rice. For one liter of filtered water, we will add 15.5 grams dry malt extract, 4.5 grams powdered gypsum, 3.5 grams nutritional yeast, and 10 grams of potato starch. Weigh out all the ingredients, add to your measured water, and mix thoroughly. The gypsum tends to settle, so give it another stir before you pour. Now we will add the grain and broth to a silicone bag. These are sold online as dough kneading bags. They are tolerant to high heat and pressure within a pressure cooker. They're sturdy, flexible, easily cleaned, and hold a good amount of substrate. Additionally, they can be reused many times over and over. Once you've added the grain and broth, give it a shake to work out air pockets. Squeeze out enough air from the bag so that the grain is completely submerged. This will help ensure an even cook. Seal the bag with a silicone tie and carefully prop it up in your pressure cooker. The bags are not completely watertight and will leak if they tip over, leaving you with a dry or partially cooked substrate. We can fit six bags in each cooker and with four cookers we can do 24 bags per day. Seal the cooker and bring it up to a boil with the valve open. You should see some vapor spitting out from the valve. Then shut the valve and let the pressure build up to 20 psi. At this point, open the valve to quickly release pressure. This forces out any remaining air pockets within the substrate or the bags. Once pressure has dropped back to zero PSI, close the valve again and build pressure back up to 20 PSI and hold it there for another 45 minutes. Then turn it off and allow to cool. The cooker should only be opened in front of a flow hood or when you are ready to work with the substrate. Removing the bags and breaking them up will help them cool down faster, but will increase odds of contamination, so it's best to just allow them to cool down overnight. So here we are at the UV chamber at Mushroom Revival. It's in our lab, and we have it set up so that we can unload anything that we've put into the chamber directly in front of our flow hood to maintain that sterility as much as possible. 
It's a fairly simple setup. We have a pretty standard metal rolling rack with four bulbs suspended below four of the shelves. The chamber itself is made of polypropylene plastic and we have brought that plastic all the way to the floor and to the ceiling and have taped it off to prevent any light leakage. The doors are zipper doors and there was some light coming through the zippers so we made these little flaps to prevent that. The reason being, germicidal UV light is harmful to your skin and your eyes and ultimately you want to avoid exposure altogether. You can wear clothing and standard sunglasses to protect yourself, but the best thing to do would just be to set it up so that you aren't exposed at all. Um, what we did for that was rig up a switch, an outlet with a switch right outside of the chamber door so we can just reach down and turn it on and off as we need. So the distance between your objects and the bulbs matters. And this is something we took into consideration as we were building the cart. This was about the most comfortable space we could get. Um, ideally, you want the bulb to be as close to your object as possible. The farther away it is, the longer it will take to radiate the stuff and deactivate any living microbes. So. We set this up to accommodate our biggest object, which was this bin, and be able to remove it comfortably without hitting the light bulb a lot. These are really high quality bulbs, but they are breakable, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. So these bulbs come from American Ultraviolet. They are expensive, but definitely a worthy investment if you plan on cultivating in this way. And they're a great company, they've been super helpful, they have super stellar customer service and have provided me with a lot of really helpful science for how long I should be radiating anything in here to kill off certain microbes. Um, they actually gave me an equation for how long to keep the light on depending on how far away the item is. Like I talked about in the video before, we really liked this method because there was no dry time and we can load up a lot of bins at once and they can all be sterile at the same time. So we can unload and inoculate pretty quickly. And this was a lot better than just wiping them down and setting them aside because during that time, things are still falling on the bins and there's really no way to make sure that it's as clean as it can possibly be moments before you introduce your substrate. So for that reason, we really liked the UV. It's also extremely effective. Uh, I've read a lot of science about it. I've done some studies here with Petri plates as well, and I was pretty happy with the results. So the UV light works like any other light, and if it's in the shadow of something and it's not getting directly radiated, you cannot guarantee that it's doing the work. So you do have to be strategic about the placement of your objects within the chamber. So for example, if I had this this flap open here and then my spoon underneath it. I couldn't guarantee that the light is hitting the spoon if it were coming from directly above. We have lined the inside of our chamber with aluminum foil. So the ceilings, the walls, and a bit of the floors are lined with aluminum foil. And this is to reflect the UV back and hopefully blast any of those areas that we would have missed. Uh, there's some science saying that aluminum foil is the most reflective surface when it comes to UV light. So in the chamber, I have two bins that we primarily work with. Uh, we have this Sterilite one, and these big boys are really nice. It helps cut down the labor a lot, but we do struggle the most with contamination with these. Uh, and it typically happens in the corners and along the edges of the bin. We also use these little bins called ECR for kids. It's just a bin that we found online and we chose it because it doesn't have any of those undercuts and we really appreciated this feature. With this bin, however, there are those things going on. So all of these little sections could potentially be a hiding spot for microbes. And this is why we do a preemptive wipe down beforehand and we make sure to really get into the grooves. And even something like a scratch can be a 
living space for microbes or spores. So if you scratch your bin with a metal spoon or a knife or even stainless steel or potentially even something like Scotch-Brite, you could be making micro valleys for these things to live and thrive. So I've seen enough contamination at this point that it's pretty safe to say, for us at least, that our main vector of contamination is these corners not being cleaned as thoroughly as they should be. If we do see contamination, it's hardly ever with these small bins, but with these big bins. If you want to experiment with UV before you commit, we bought this pretty basic germicidal UV light off of Amazon for $40, $50, and it works. We still use it today, in fact. Uh, we typically load up four shelves with our bins, and then we'll put the spoons on the bottom to get this shorter light. The lifespan is probably also shorter with that one, and ultimately it just isn't as effective, that would be my guess. These lights last for two years if you were to leave them on all the time. And we probably only use them 30 to 45 minutes per day that we are inoculating. If we're dealing with contamination or have reclaimed some bins that had contamination, we'll probably UV them for an hour. So it definitely varies, but with that in mind, these bulbs can last you for a very long time. We've experimented with a number of bins and have chosen to scale up with the 37 quart Sterilite and small ECR bins. Our favorite one is the 37 quart bin. We removed the foam gasket and replaced it with food grade antimicrobial silicone. We drilled 15 3 quarter inch holes in each lid. This was the first number we chose and never tried less or more, but found that 15 was working just fine. The clear film you see over the holes is a medical grade tape called Tegaderm. This material is more resilient to UV light and moisture and can be reused a number of times. This bin is our favorite because it is the quickest to inoculate and harvest. The caveat is that it is more susceptible to contamination due to all of the concave and convex geometries. For our processes, one silicone bag equals one Sterilite bin. Our second favorite is to use these small bins encased in a standard mushroom filter bag. We used bags with filters of 0.2 and 0.5 microns. Both worked very well for us. When we decided to buy more bags, we chose the 0.2 micron mesh. For these bins, one silicone bag makes about five bins. This setup with a polyfill and mason jar ring was something we threw together with supplies at our farm. While this did work, we found that the free air exchange was too much for most of the bins, and many of them got dry on the top and the mushrooms began to fruit from the bottom. We suggest using a smaller ring or rubber band to minimize the polyfill filter if you choose to try this. We have also worked with the smaller 12 quart Sterilite where we drilled eight three quarter inch holes with micropore tape. You will notice it still has the foam gasket it was purchased with. The gasket is not likely to be a problem the first time you try to, to use this bin, but could eventually become a problematic feature due to its porous structure, making it difficult to clean. And finally, we experimented with the same polyfill filter and ring, but with two bins in one bag. This worked nearly the same as the individual ones.
shout out to Alex Dora for providing the space, the knowledge, and the resources to develop this method. And shout out to Alan Callahan, my coworker, who really helped dial in the recipe and moisture levels for this video, as well as anybody involved in the Cordyceps Militaris community who I've learned from, including William Padilla Brown and Ryan Paul Gates. Also, shout out to everybody tuning in and supporting Mushroom Revival. If you do have questions about these methods, please don't hesitate to reach out. This is completely open source, and although we're trying to be as detailed as possible, inevitably we will skip over some things, so please reach out. We look forward to your feedback, so any criticism or ideas that you have within this method, please share. Um, we want to grow as a community, and much love. Thanks again for watching and we will see you soon.